Recording in progress. Ah, hi, everyone. Sorry, my computer is so slow. It always takes me a few minutes to get into these Zoom meetings. All right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, morning, everyone. Uh, so I've, I've had to switch things around a little bit. So today we're doing uh, dreams and dreaming. Um, I don't know what we'll do next time. I think, um, well, let's talk about that toward the end. But my preference is anomalistic psychology. That'll give me a little bit more time to uh, prep some additional topics. Uh, I think I originally had cryptozoology um, scheduled for this week, but um, we, we forgot, uh, I, I, I guess since I ended lecture early last time because of the wisdom tooth pain, I forgot to get us to pick a cryptid. Um, so maybe that's something we can also do toward the end of the lecture today is choose a cryptid to discuss for our cryptozoology lecture. Um, all right. Otherwise, uh, the uh, we could get started. Um, oh, Mothman's a good one. Yeah, yeah. Put you can you can put your things in here, uh, suggestions in here, or uh, we'll discuss at the end of class. So I'll I'll touch mostly on dreams and dreaming, but there will be time to get into a little bit about um, astral projection. Oh, exorcisms. Yeah, that would be a good one, actually. Yeah. Uh, there would there would be time to get into um, a little bit about uh, out of body experiences, astral projection, and perhaps even reality shifting. Although that is also something we can save for a separate class: reality shifting and the Mandela effect. Ah, uh, well, the reality shifting essentially is the idea that you can switch universes. Like, kind of like um, um, that movie, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, but like not less sci-fi, more paranormal. Um, <clears throat> La Lorna, I don't know what that is. I would have to look into that. Um, but if it's a creature from folklore um, that people try to actually go and find out in nature, I would say it counts, but not, not having heard of it, I'm not sure. Uh, the essay proposal due date. Yeah, I do have an announcement about that to make. Um, I'm going to push that back. I don't think you'll have um, feedback for your, uh, for your first reading responses yet, but I will post an instructional video on how to tackle the essay proposal. And I'm also considering uh, doing away with the final reading response. Now, I'm not just gonna get rid of it completely. Um, what I would do is replace it because I can't push it something worth 20% back into the last day, uh, week of class. But I can replace it with a quiz, like a cumulative quiz. Um, yeah, the the well, I'm I'm talking about the. I'm not talking. Yeah, I'm talking about the proposal and the final reading response. The proposal, which was due tomorrow, will be extended. The final reading response, I will swap out for a quiz. I can push it back, but I will. I can't have something worth twenty percent due on the last week of class. So what I'll probably have to do is. Um, Switch it for a quiz. The quiz will be worth less. It'll be like a cumulative quiz. Take that, uh, make the quiz worth 10%, take the other 10% and split it between the essay proposal and the reading response or the exam or something like that, right? N no, the proposal will not be due tomorrow. I'm extending the deadline um, because I want to give you guys some instructions on how to, to do it. So. Either I will record a lecture or I will refer you to one of my old lectures. Um, so, so, so the exam info is in the course outline. Um, it, the, the, the final paper is the exam. 
It's a take home exam. So all of that is in the outline. Um, yeah, I know. I, uh, Alicia, a lot of you are taking other classes. Some of you are in both of my classes. <laughs> so I know that everybody's feeling kind of slammed right now. Right. Um, so that's the idea. Um, I'm probably going to do the same in my other class. Well, I've already extended the deadline in, in my other class, but yeah, I think I want to swap out that final reading response for something like a quiz where I would just quiz you on key terms and concepts. Um, it would be simple, just simple multiple choice, you know, just something. Um, and then the, the exam is a take home exam, of course, which is the research paper. So I think that's what we'll do. So nobody worry about the essay proposal. It's not due yet. I'll probably push it back by a week or so. Um, and I think I have an old essay writing lecture um, from one of my previous paranormal classes. Um, I will try and dig that up and um, make the link available on my Discord server. And you can all check that out. And then you'll all have some idea of what is required of the essay proposal. Yeah, so... I mean, and I'm happy to help. I'm glad that you guys like this idea. It also makes my life a little bit easier because I am uh, juggling a lot right now. Um, so yeah, I hope this makes all of our lives easier. Um, so let's get started with dreams and dreaming. Um, share my screen. Yeah, I mean, uh, like Taylor was saying, if you want to um, start on the proposal, that's fine. Um, the template is available after all. And there are um, minimal instructions in the template. There are instructions in the course outline. But uh, I do like to do a video because in the video, I also cover how to um, turn your proposal into an essay. Um, well, the reading response is a different kind of thing. So like, even if we're able to get you the feedback before it's due, uh, it's the extent to which it'll help you with the proposal is limited. Um, so, you know, it'll help you to the extent that you'll uh, get some feedback on spelling and grammar and and stuff but otherwise yeah i'm not sure how helpful that feedback will be um no unfortunately jack i don't um i am i am trying to uh work away on this as is jenna in each of my classes both of the tas um were assigned a little later than usual and there's just nothing i can do about that um so we'll have your feedback to you as soon as we can. Um, uh, but I don't know for certain when that will be. So just as soon as we can. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> it does. Uh, yeah, marking is brutal sometimes. But not when it's this class, usually, because these things tend to be pretty fun to read. Um, but anyway, let's start. Um, get my slideshow going. Still a little sore in the mornings. It's hard to talk, but I think we can go full lecture today. Besides, I... I went back to the dentist. I was worried I was getting a dry socket. And he said, you're not. But here's some stuff I'm going to jam in your, your socket anyway. As a preventative measure. Tastes like cloves. Yeah, I don't know what it is. But apparently it disinfects and tastes, tastes like cloves. But the, the whole day, my mouth was like, like I'd been drinking chai tea, which is not a bad thing. Anyway, okay. So I like talking about dreams for this class because dreams are one of those mental phenomena that 
we used to think were very mysterious, uh, supernatural or divine in origin. Um, but what we can now study them with the tools of cognitive science. And I think this is particularly interesting if you're also uh, interested in the mind. So if you're not just a paranormal person, but you're also interested in understanding the mind and the brain, uh, dreaming is something you ought to be interested in as well. For example, uh, this is one of the things claimed by Blackmore in chapter 23. Uh, dreams uh, might help us to understand the difference between, say, waking consciousness and unconsciousness or sleep. Or maybe there are some interesting differences between um, brain activity during waking consciousness and dreaming. And these might help us to identify something that we call the neural correlates of consciousness. Uh, consciousness, subjective consciousness, your experience of the world is uh, quite a difficult thing to explain. And we're, we're, still, um, we're still working on this, and I think we will for quite some time, or will be for quite some time. But one of the things that could help us is to identify um, what sorts of brain activity are correlated with what states of mind or mental states um unconsciousness is um is one of those states so that's good and of course by discussing the difference between dr dreaming and waking we can clarify what we mean uh when we're talking about conscious and unconscious experience um which is also helpful so what is a dream anyway? Here are some answers you get if you do a quick web search, right? Uh, Google Dictionary has it that a dream is a series of thoughts, images, and sensations occurring in a person's mind during sleep. Wikipedia will tell you that a dream is a succession of images, ideas, and emotions and sensations that usually occur involuntarily in the mind during certain stages of sleep. So, okay, it's a little bit more precise than Google. And most technical def definitions of dreaming and dreams agree with this. They are a series of thoughts, images, so on, or a succession of images, ideas, and so on that occur during particular phases of sleep, in particular REM sleep. What these, what's interesting to me is that these two don't say that they are experiences. And that's something that I that I hope we'll have occasion to talk about as we near uh, the midpoint or end of this lecture is whether dreams count as experiences. And we'll try to clarify what we mean by that as we proceed. Now, most dreams occur during a particular stage of sleep called rapid eye movement sleep uh, or REM sleep. REM is characterized by a full body paralysis, except for the heart, the lungs, and the eyes. So you've probably seen your pets dreaming, or maybe you've seen a partner dreaming, or uh, a family member fell asleep on the couch and they're having a dream. You'll see their eyes moving beneath their eyelids, of course, like this. You'll see their breathing uh, fluctuate. It won't be slow and regular. It could be fast and shallow one minute and then slower the next. You may have seen your pets, um, your pets doing this, right? I think my dog is nearing, nearing sleep now, in fact. She's just laying there and any minute now she might start having a dream. Then you'd see her sort of twitching and stuff, right? If we were to examine your brain, um, while you are in a dream, say you're in the sleep lab and we hook you up to an EEG or an electroencephalograph, um, we would see that your brain is nearly as active at it, as it is when you're awake. During REM sleep, that is. Um, 
you would see lots of activity in all kinds of places that we would see if we were to look at your brain, if you were just awake going about your business. We'd see um, one interesting thing is that we would see a lot of thalamocortical loop activity. And what that means is in the brain, um, deep within the brain, there is a, a, a part of the brain called the thalamus, which kind of is like a hub. Information goes back and forth from the thalamus to different areas of the cortex. For example, when you're using your vision, um, nerve signals travel from the optic nerve to the um to the lateral geniculate nucleus, which is part of the thalamus. Then they go to the visual cortex. And after a little bit of processing in the visual cortex, a lot of that goes back to the thalamus. And from there, some of that goes back to higher areas of the visual cortex, and some of it goes elsewhere. These loops are implicated in consciousness by many neuroscientists. So it's interesting that we see them when we're dreaming. One thing we don't see is activity is very much activity in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And that is interesting because that area is associated with reason, um, with executive function, with, with critical thinking, right? Which might explain why dreams are so weird and we don't realize it while we're dreaming. So here are the stages of sleep that you'll go through on a typical night if you get a good sleep. Oh, excuse me. As you can tell, I did not get a good sleep. So you start off from wakefulness. You may hit a very, very brief bit of REM sleep um, as you fall deeper and deeper into deep sleep. Sometimes we call this slow wave sleep because when we're looking at um, the output of the electroencephalograph, which, uh, which is showing us something called brain waves. Um, we've got to be careful here. Brain waves are just a measure, right? Um, what they are a measure of is uh, electrical conductivity at the scalp. And that electrical conductivity changes. Um, as your brain is engaged with something um, because your brain is an electrical chemical organ. So we can de detect these changes by placing all these little electrodes on the scalp. And we would see uh, your, your, the measure of your brain activity would give us a slow regular wave. So um, Several times throughout the night, you come up out of deep sleep into REM sleep, and you kind of keep doing this throughout the night, as you can see here. Uh, you'll go down into deep sleep and come back up for REM sleep at the top of these cycles. And you'll notice that as the night gets longer, your REM cycles get longer. So when you're falling asleep, you might have a very, very brief dream. Maybe one of those dreams where you think you're falling and your brain wakes you up with a myoclonic jerk or something, right? But if you make it to sleep, you'll go deep, deep into sleep and then come back up for a REM cycle. And unless you awaken from this REM cycle, you probably won't remember this dream. Likewise with this dream and this dream and this dream. You only remember dreams when you awaken from them. Otherwise, it's very difficult to recall dreams. Actually, it's very difficult to recall dreams even if you've awakened from a dream. But notice that your REM periods get longer throughout the night. And this will be important for later because some of you might want to try your hand at lucid dreaming. And uh, there are ways you can take advantage of this, this longer REM cycle as the night goes on, if you want to try and have a dream where you know you're in a dream. It's kind of cool. All right, get myself out of the way here. Now, most dreams occur in REM sleep, but sometimes it can happen that you'll have a dream that is reported when someone is awakened from non-REM sleep or deep sleep. But these dreams seem to be much less vivid, and they're much harder to recall. They're not really like visual. They're, I've seen them described as thought-like. You may have the sense 
that you do not dream. Perhaps because you don't recall your dreams. You never recall your dreams. But in fact, everybody dreams, barring certain weird medical disorders. Um, everybody dreams. Um, uh, several times a night, in fact. Uh, actually, when I, was, um, when I was doing the enrichment mini course version of this class for some high school students recently, one of the students if I remember correctly, said that they are on some kind of medication that um, minimizes their dreams. And I thought, oh, that's unfortunate. But it was necessary, of course, uh, because of this student's, I, I guess, medical condition, right? Uh, but barring special cases like that, we dream every night. It's just that we have a great deal of difficulty recalling our dreams unless we've awakened from them. For example, I don't remember what I dreamed about, I don't know, last night or this morning. Um, my alarm woke me up and I, I woke up, didn't remember a dream, so I suppose I didn't wake up from a REM cycle. But yesterday, I slept in a little bit and um, I can recall a very weird dream where one of the things that happened was I was back at an old job, an old part-time job that I had been working. And I was like, why am I here? I just quit this job. But you see, in real life, I had quit. And then the supervisor had asked for a formal letter of resignation. And I said, sure, I'll get that to you. And then I completely forgot because I'm busy. So I'm dreaming I'm working at this place and um, well, why am I working here? And the manager says, hey, you didn't give us a letter of resignation. You say so you got to work here. And it was a dream. So obviously I was just like, oh, OK. And I just kind of went with it. Right. Um, not realizing that none of it was real. Um, so, yeah, that's interesting. Um, you know, when you when you recall dreams, it's usually because you've awakened from them. Um, Ah, uh, well, maybe you will learn. Um, it takes practice. I mean, after all, lucid dreaming is actually a skill. And it, um, it needs a little development, right? It is some, there's a learning curve. It requires practice. It's, it's tricky. It's tricky. Mm. I mean, that, that may be, uh, but I, I disagree that dreams are messages or more recently, um, I mean, the, as we'll see, dreams were thought to be messages from the divine or the supernatural, right? Um, gods would send you dreams, then later just God would send you a dream or something like that, right? Um. Then, then once Freud entered the picture, we kind of got this idea that dreams were sort of like uh, unconscious messages to yourself, uh, which they also aren't quite like that, at least not as I understand them. Um, but maybe we can talk about this. We could talk about dream interpretation and, and dream meaning and stuff later. Um, yeah. uh, no, actually, it does not. Uh, well, I mean not having a lucid dream itself. Um, if you have a lucid dream, so you realize you're dreaming and you're like, oh, I'm gonna do a bunch of cool stuff. Maybe you go fly around like Superman or something like that. Um, and a lot of people are kind of like, well, would that make me wake up feeling tired? And the answer is no. In fact, usually it makes people wake up feeling energized because it's a new experience. Um, also, the two most common things people do in lucid dreams, according to surveys, are flying and sex. So um, these are things that I suppose get people like, yeah, let's go, right? At the, uh, at the start of your day, right? Um, so it doesn't. It, uh, but that said, if you're putting too much time into all of the other stuff at the expense of getting sleep, then yes, absolutely, that will affect your quality of sleep, right? 
Yeah, Janita, some people are like that. They could just do it and then they kind of lose the knack for it. And some people have a really, really hard time. And then all of a sudden they're great at it. Oh, yeah. Okay, so if that's interesting, Taylor, you can wake yourself up. But know this, if you can lucid dream, then you don't have to wake up from a nightmare. You can just make it not a nightmare. So that's, that's interesting. Oh, bite your thumb. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah, it's tricky, Tabitha. Like, I mean, sometimes... Here, I'm just going to full screen this. Um, sometimes we... Um, uh, I mean, a lucid dream doesn't necessarily mean that you can change the dream. Um, I certainly can't. I can't, like, snap my fingers and make it not a nightmare or something. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, we'll talk about lucid dreaming uh, later on. Um, and also, perhaps, dream interpretation. So... Uh, other mammals um, besides human beings dream, of course. Uh, some of you in the comments mentioned that you've seen your pet dream. I've seen my dog dream. Maybe she's dreaming now. No. Oh. Hard to tell. Here's my pupper. <laughs> Are you dreaming? Oh, no. No. Awake. Awake. Puffer is awake. She's chilling with me, though. She likes to hang out with me when I lecture. <laughs> uh, but when she's dreaming, of course, she's twitching. And uh, who knows what she's dreaming about? I, I, I suspect that people's intuitions are correct, that dogs dream about dog things. Chasing toys and rabbits or barking at things. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what dogs dream about. Um, my cats, too, obviously. Um, when cats are... <clears throat> when cats and dogs are in REM sleep, they kind of sprawl out. Their breathing is irregular. The rapid eye movement is apparent. Um, this is really interesting. Many birds seem to also dream. And that's interesting because birds don't have the same kind of brains as we do. Yeah, Conrad. Yeah, like one time my dog Tula was doing that and she was like barking in the dream like, uh, uh, this is what it sounded like to us. But she woke herself up barking <laughs> at whatever she was barking at in the dream. It was the cutest thing ever. Hey, Toots, where are you going? Huh? What are you doing? Hey, baby. Oh, you still look so sleepy. Why don't you, why don't you go to sleep and have yourself a dog dream? So yeah, um, uh, do, 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 do. oh wow, okay, that's interesting. Yeah. So birds definitely dream. Some birds, uh, which is interesting, as I mentioned, because um, like we are mammals, so of course we have a neocortex. Uh, birds don't. Birds kind of have like a bird equivalent of that. Um, and that's because birds are dinosaurs, of course. It used to be, we used to say birds evolved from dinosaurs, but uh, I think the scientific con consensus has changed such that birds are just straight up dinosaurs. Um, which is pretty cool. And dinosaurs were, of course, reptiles with very small brains. Nowadays, birds um, have larger brains. Um, birds, some birds are pretty smart, but um, but um, their brains are nonetheless different than mammal brains. Um, yet, some of them seem to be able to dream. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, when I think of sleeping birds, I always think of an owl sitting on the tree with his with with his face tucked into his feathers, you know. Interestingly, some mammals don't dream. 
Dolphins, for example, their brains kind of sleep one hemisphere at a time. So the mammalian brain is divided into two cerebral hemispheres, the right and the left. And when we go to sleep, both hemispheres go to sleep. But for a dolphin, because they got to be a, they got to be a dolphin and swim around and keep breathing air because they're mammals. Um, you can't just go to sleep. Otherwise, you might drown. So what if one half of your brain sleeps at a time? Perfect solution. But the consequence is you don't dream. Ah. So as I said um, earlier, you might have the sense that you don't actually dream very much. Perhaps you think you don't dream at all, but everybody dreams. If we didn't dream, that would probably be bad for us. Dreaming seems to serve some purpose. Um, there's a reason why it's there. Uh, we're not quite sure what it is, um, but it seems like it does important stuff for us, right? Um, and we'll look, at, we'll look at what those things might be. It could be memory consolidation. It could be um, rehearsal for like uh, real life stuff, like threats. Um, it could be like your brain's way of the, the human brain equivalent of defragmenting a hard drive. Um, or they might not be for anything at all. Hey, <laughs> yeah. It is like a surprise movie. Yeah, I mean, Alicia, that's kind of like what Freud thought. Uh, but I suspect you th you're probably thinking in a different, uh, slightly different than Freud. But nonetheless, we'll, we will discuss that idea. I think, I think they are, I mean, essentially, yeah. Uh, if, if dreams are involved in memory consolidation or something like that, then yeah, that's basically information processing. Um, but we'll we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Uh, okay. Mm. Yeah, it could be like that too. Um, like as you say, freestyle rapping, and I'll explain. I'll explain how. Um, like a stream of consciousness sort of thing. Like dreams. It could be that dreams are just stream of consciousness type movies. Movies in the head. But uh, we'll see. Um, why is it hard to remember our dreams? Um, well, maybe it's because uh, if we remembered incorrect information from a dream. Yeah, okay, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, um, doesn't have to be one or the other. Um, it might be maladaptive to remember our dreams. We might get things mixed up things that are real and things that are not so maybe if dreams are hard to remember um because it would be dangerous uh if we remembered them too vividly and got details mixed up i don't know about this theory though because uh, people do remember their dreams quite frequently in fact <laughs> um i think it might just be a consequence of going from rem sleep to wakefulness um where the brain is in such a state such that uh it's not easy to remember your dream and sometimes this happens where i'll wake up and not remember a dream and then when i go to bed that night and i put my head down on the pillow it all flashes back to me what i dreamed about the previous night so so yeah i don't know why uh, but it could be because uh, it's maladaptive. So this would be similar to why we don't get up and act out our dreams. The, when we're in REM sleep, we're paralyzed. <clears throat> yeah, Conrad, that's a good way to remember your dreams. If you, if, when we talk about lucid dreaming later, uh, everyone's going to want to keep this in mind because uh, what you want to do is sit up like you do, or what I used to do is just sit still and try and keep still like in bed. Um, think about the dream. And then if I really wanted to remember it, I'd jot it down in sort of point form. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe like we had a dream about something um, and then 
so you have a dream about something, you forget it, but you encounter something similar in real life such that you experience that feeling of familiarity. That's plausible. I don't know if that's what explains all cases of deja vu, but it's certainly plausible uh, to my mind. Mm, what's that? Well, not exactly. I'm not saying that we have precognitive dreams. What I'm saying is that, say I happen to dream about a certain house, right? As a matter of fact, I have a dream house. It's really weird. It's, it's, it's always in my dreams. It's different every time, but it's the same house somehow. This always looks different from the outside. But once I get in, there's always this labyrinthine set of corridors that leads to this part of the house that's always the same. It's really weird. But anyways, say I dream of a house. Um, and I don't re remember the dream, but you know, then I'm walking around, do 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 do, and and I walk past this house that happens to look like the one I dreamed about. Um, I might get this feeling of familiarity, like I've done this before. Uh, when I haven't, in fact, been at that house, I've just dreamed of walking past a similar one. That might explain some cases of deja vu. Um, but, but as I was going to say, it's possible that we do not remember our dreams for the same reason that we don't get up and actually act out our dreams. It would be dangerous, right? Um, oh. That's something that I think is important to emphasize. Sleepwalking or somnambulism. Uh, this actually occurs during non-REM sleep. So some people have the impression that um, when you're sleepwalking, what you're, do what you're doing is dreaming and you're just kind of acting out your dream. This is not typically the case with somnambulism. Uh, somnambulism actually occurs during non-REM sleep. <clears throat> But imagine that if you did get up and move about during your dream, you would be in danger, potentially. You might fall out of a window or walk into traffic, right? So <coughs> huh. huh, that's interesting. Both of those are interesting. It's kind of like uh, the Matrix. And, and oh, that's another thing. Dreaming may be for learning. Um, have you guys ever seen The Matrix? Like the, the first one, 1999, The Wachowskis, The Matrix. Wow, 1999, so long ago. So you know when Neo's learning Kung Fu? Oh, sweet. Yeah, philosophy class is a good place to watch The Matrix. It's probably one of my favorite movies. I, well, definitely one of my favorites. Uh, very philosophical. And uh, so, so, you know, Neo, our main character, he's going to learn Kung Fu. And, you know, they're just plugging it into his brain, right? Just, um, and he can practice it in the Matrix with Morpheus. You know, the whole, you think that's air you're breathing now, right? That whole scene. Um, so that might be what dreams, that might be a function of dreams too, is uh, sort of like rehearsal or practice, the brain's way of rehearsing or practicing certain skills. Um, so if you dream about fighting, and by the way, this is not, this is not really that far-fetched. I mean, sports psychologists have long known that, say you take two people, not uh, say basketball, you take two groups of people and you have, um, some people who, and they're like me, they suck at basketball but they have people shoot hoops and they have a group that just shoots the hoops. And then they have a group that imagines shooting the basketball for an hour or so. And then they go and actually do it. And the people who mentally rehearse it do better than the people who don't. Dreams might serve a function like that. So if you imagine practicing your Kung Fu or you dream about practicing your Kung Fu or whatever, um, you get better at it. Um, yeah, imagination is powerful. I do this with guitar sometimes when I don't have the chance to practice. I have a head fretboard 
just because I've played guitar for a lot, a long time. Um, so I can just noodle um, without a guitar. Uh, if I want to work out how to, you know, fret a certain chord or whatever, I, you can just use your imagination. That takes practice, mind you. <laughs> so, um, oh, interesting. Yeah, dreaming about a coding problem is a cool example. Um, oh, interesting. So math sneaks in. So coding, math, could be whatever your interests are. Um, uh, but you see where this sort of dreams as rehearsal idea might, might uh, gain some traction, right? Yeah, practice, wait, practice is a good, is a good approach. People practice too much. Yeah, like Maria says here, exactly. It's this exact kind of thing. Um, maybe that's what dreams are for. Um, and by the way, if you're practicing anything, don't practice too much. I know that some people say this is especially bad in the guitar community. Um, this is, um, this is something that happened to me in high school, right? In high school, I was a guitar player. I was a guitar player in the band. We didn't have a normal band. We had a rock band. It was, um, 24 piece, full horn section, full vocals, keyboards, two basses, two guitars, full stage crew. It was dope. And, um, So I practiced a lot, naturally. Um, I, we, we would rehearse four nights a week for three hours. Plus you're practicing on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday learning songs. So at least three hours a day, at least. Um, but probably closer to four or five. And even some people would say that is too much. That's not grinding away to get good that's just learning the songs playing the songs rehearsing the songs not like practicing your shreddies or whatever but then there was this one dude he wasn't in the band he was just some some student comes to school one day with his wrist wrapped in gauze and everyone's like what happened oh man i practiced guitar for like 12 hours man i'm gonna be so fast later and, and I thought to myself, like, it was like one of those, it was, it was really cringe, you know, because I thought like, first of all, you're just going to hurt yourself. You're not going to be able to play guitar after that. And secondly, as I learned years later, you actually do not need to practice for hours and hours and hours and hours to acquire a new skill. You want, especially if it's something like music or martial arts or you know, sports, anything with muscle memory, you want to give a specific thing about five or 10 minutes and then stop. Then come back to it the next day and do it again. So your practice should be built out of a few hours of lots of little things like that, not like just six hours running the same scales like this guy was doing. So anyway, keep that in mind. Um, yeah. <laughs> Assuming he can, um, assuming he can, uh, he can come back. I don't know what that guy's doing now. I didn't keep in touch. He was the kind of guitar player who was like, unless you can play Holy fast. Shit, so that reading response, I told you that I like fucking banged out. <laughs> shit, my bad. It's That's so okay. Sorry, That's okay. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I, I haven't, I haven't kept in touch with this guy, um, but I remember him as being, um, you know, the faster, one of those faster is better guitar players, which, um, I don't know. What's up, Toots? Got a catch in your throat? Oh, it's okay. Sorry, my dog had a little coughing fit there. Um, <clears throat> no, that's okay. Um, that was kind of funny. Um, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah. Um, oh, nice. Nice. Hey, that's great. That's great. <laughs> so, um, 
Yeah, that's super, super. Okay. Um, so like I was hinting at earlier, a lot of people around the world in many different times and places believe that dreams came from some divine or supernatural source. So um, I like to start with the ancient Greeks, of course, because I'm a philosopher, but they believed in a figure called Morpheus. Morpheus means shaper, shaper of form. And he is the principal god of dreams. Um, Apollo is also associated with dreams. Um, Apollo can get Morpheus to send one of his Oniroi. Oniroi are dreams. They're little, little gods. They preside over various aspects of dreaming and they're sent to you by Morpheus. Um, the character Morpheus, I believe I've mentioned this before, um, but uh, Neil Gaiman does something really interesting with a Morpheus sort of character in his Sandman series. That's right. I mentioned this when we were reading Hoffman. Um, definitely check that out if you're curious. And I think the Netflix show does a really good job with the series too. Uh, and there's little dreaming Easter eggs in it, in the show. Um, when people are in the dreaming, it's very hard to read text. Um, uh, they've got this weird nonsensical sign in one cutscene, which I thought was very like, oh, they've done their homework for this one. Because in dreams, it turns out reading text is actually incredibly difficult. Um, <clears throat> um, but other cultures, of course, have attributed um, dreams to the divine. Uh, oh, oh, excuse me. In Australia, the Aboriginal people that lived there believed that the universe was dreamt into existence. And in the Bible, in the Old Testament, uh, the prophet Daniel interprets the dreams of King Nebuchadnezzar II. So, um, hmm, I don't know. I don't know why it's rare to see a reflection in a dream. I've never thought about it. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even sure that it, that it, that it is. Um, some people might dream of reflections a lot. Um, I don't know. Uh, let's come back to that. You know, some... Uh, some scientific breakthroughs were even um, attributed to uh, or, or said to have been inspired uh, by dreams. Um, I mean, that's, I, I'm not sure about that. Um, a lot of people have these interesting notions about dreams. Um, the worst one being if you die in a dream, you die in real life. Um, no. Uh, I've seen my reflection in a dream. It's no problem. It does not break the dream. Um, it's just not very well represented. Uh, and, and again, we'll talk about the reasons why. Um, uh, so scientific breakthroughs, inspiration. Um, a chemist uh, named Kukule dreamt of an Ouroboros, which is a snake devouring its own tail. Um. And um, he claimed that this led him to discover the structure of the benzene molecule, which is a sort of hexagonal, almost Ouroboros-like shape. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I've died in dreams, too. What happens when I die in a dream is I wake up, <laughs> you know, like, oh, I'm dead. Uh, uh, ah! Wake up all of a sudden. Okay. So for a long time, we thought that dreams came from the divine. Um, probably the first, you know, the first account of dreaming that ought to concern us, modern account that is, uh, is, uh, is Sigmund Freud's account. Yeah. <laughs> quick save and yeah um yeah you're yeah i'll i'll talk about why it might have looked like your face was like it felt like an acid trip we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that um so 
um, Sigmund Freud has a psychoanalytic theory of dreams. <sighs> and you can read about these ideas in his book, The Interpretation of Dreams. Now, he thought that a lot of dreams are a, a, a kind of unconscious wish fulfillment. So you have a wish. Um, maybe you want to, uh, I don't know, go on a date. Maybe you want to date um, your celebrity crush, right? Um, so you might have a dream uh, to the extent that that gets fulfilled, fulfilled, but it is censored. Um, so it's all symbolized by the unconscious mind, right? To sort of protect your ego. Um, um, dreams can also be expressions of repressed fears, um, wish fulfillment, you know, like desires, other uh, trauma that trauma that's happened to you, for example. Because remember, for Freud, everything is like repression and then return of the repressed. So. Um, maybe I have a bad experience and I repress it. I try and forget about it, push it into my unconscious and inevitably re-emerges, uh, but it's censored or symbolized in a dream to protect me. Um, and Freud thought that interpreting the dreams of his patients was very important in the psychoanalytic process. Um, and yeah, maybe, um, but dreams are not really like unconscious wish fulfillment, like Freud thought they could be. I mean, you, that's not to say that you never have a dream about something that you desire to do, right? That's not to say that that doesn't happen. It's just that dreaming isn't just for that. Um, and it's also probably not symbolized and censored in the way that Freud says. Um, you know, we've talked about the Oedipus complex. I mean, that idea comes from that book, The Interpretation of Dreams, that the unconscious desire to um, kill your father and marry your mother is, is the Oedipus complex. And Freud would say this might emerge in a dream, but everything would be symbolically disguised to protect the ego, right? Uh, I don't think that dreams are messages to ourselves. Um, and I'm skeptical about interpreting them in this way. I mean, there's sort of a weak sense in which you can interpret a dream. If I have an anxiety dream or a nightmare, that might indicate something important in my mental life, for sure. If I'm having an anxiety dream, um, maybe it's because I'm anxious about something coming up. If I have a nightmare, is that connected to some, some traumatic event that happened to me that I need to deal with, right? I mean, sure, there's that. But this whole like, oh, you dreamt of... Um, you dreamt of murdering, um, I don't know. You dreamt of killing uh, this, um, you know, I, I don't know. You dreamt of murdering Vanna White with a sword. Clearly you have an unconscious desire to marry your mother, Mary, right? Um, that's a bit silly to me. I don't know why I picked Vanna White. I could not think of a celebrity. I'm very bad with celebrities. Um, um, yeah. Uh, and, and I haven't watched Wheel of Fortune in years. Anyway. Oh, what would Freud say about that, huh? What would Freud say about my example? Mm. So Owen Flanagan, um, a cognitive scientist and philosopher, if I'm not mistaken, he calls dreams evolutionary epiphenomena. What that means is that dreams play no causal role in the mental. An epiphenomenon is something that's like all effect, no cause. So um, <laughs> I was saying, uh, well, I meant, I, 
Yeah. Uh, Freud is so weird. Um, yeah. Let, let's, let's forget about Freud for now. Uh, otherwise I'm going to go down a bunch of weird, weird rabbit holes, but uh, Owen Flanagan says that dreams are evolutionary epiphenomena. So they play no causal role in the mental. Um, uh, epiphenomenon, uh, an epiphenomenon is something that is, is just an effect, but, but plays no causal role in anything. So, uh, TH Huxley's famous example would be the, um, the whistle on a steam engine, you know, the engine can affect the whistle. So whoop, steam goes and blows the whistle. The whistle does not affect the engine. The blowing of the whistle does nothing to the steam engine. Um, so dreams might be like that. They can be caused, but they play no causal role themselves. What, what Flanagan is saying here sounds more to me like what um, paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould used to describe as a spandrel. Um, it's a feature that's evolved for no clear reason. It's just there. Um, the way Flanagan puts this, dreaming came along as a free rider on a system designed to think and sleep. Yeah, fine. That does not mean they're epiphenomena. Uh, it means they're something more like a spandrel. Like, um, uh, what's a good idea? What's a good example of a spandrel? something that a creature has, but it doesn't seem to do anything. Uh, maybe something like the, the human appendix, right? Um, uh, yeah, wisdom teeth, tailbone. Yeah, these things, um, now we could think of them as spandrels. They used to serve a purpose, now they don't. Um, but then there are other things like that we're just not sure what they're for. Um, those could be spandrels too. Um, but the thing is, Flanagan saying dreams don't have a function, but they can have effects. If they can have effects, they're not epiphenomena, right? So I think this term is not really being used correctly here. The, the dreams are more like a spandrel. They are not epiphenomena. Alan Hobson also thinks this way, though. They don't have a function. There's also anti Ravonsuo's threat simulation theory. Um, and what that theory says is that dreams are there to simulate threats and practice dealing with them. What's the evidence? Well, um, modern dreams, like uh, when, we, when we get people to record their dreams in, in a journal and we take a look at what those dreams are like, bring in an independent reviewer or oh, me, an independent judge, they note that there are more threatening stimuli in the dream than we typically face in everyday life. So dreams might be a sort of threat rehearsal. Um, Humphrey has a similar idea. He thinks of dreaming as a sort of play. He writes, dreaming represents the most audacious and ingenious of nature's tricks for educating her psychologists. So dreams um, might be a kind of mental play. And this is very plausible to me. After all, um, all animals uh, use uh, that play do so to learn. It's not just for fun. It's actually how they learn. Uh, like think about how a cat learns to hunt. It starts off by, you know, playing with little things that in its environment could be sticks, little cat toys, little balls of paper, whatever. It starts out with that. And that's how cats learn to hunt, uh, to hunt birds and mice and so forth, right? And we're really no different. But maybe dreaming is a sort of virtual reality playground, if you like, um, that we can um, use in order to learn new things. Um, and both of these, by the way, support the idea that we can actually use dreaming together with imagination to practice things. So, um, oh, oh, Tula. Uh, could dreams be for um, memory consolidation? 
Yeah. As I mentioned earlier. Oh, Tula, are you okay? You okay? Why don't you go drink some water? Hmm? So um, memory consolidation is all about moving things into long-term memory. And dreaming may play a role in that. Kind of like what I said before. Uh, like, ugh, like defragmenting your hard drive, as it were. Um, dreams could also be for learning to deal with new situations. Um, and, and for any of these ideas to be true, it doesn't matter that we don't remember our dreams. Because these are not things that we do consciously. They're skills, right? Memory consolidation doesn't matter. We don't need to remember our dreams for that. Our dreams are just the result of our brain moving things around. Um, if dreaming is play, it's like we're practicing skills. If, it's, if dreaming is for threat rehearsal, we're practicing skills. Skills are rapid, automatic. You don't have to consciously apply them. So we don't actually need to remember our dreams for any of this to work, right? Um, let's see, what time are we at here? We'll go for a little bit longer. Actually, um, yeah, no, let's, let's go for a little bit longer. Say till 12.45, and then we'll take a break. But how does the brain put a dream together? I like this idea from Stephen LaBerge, um, who points out that the brain, when it's in REM sleep, is nearly as active as it is when we are awake. Why? Well, the brain is doing the same thing it does when the brain is awake as when we're asleep. Uh, namely, it's representing you and an environment. It's representing a body and a world and putting you in that world. Now, when the brain does this in waking life, it's using information from the senses to do this, uh, together with concepts, obviously, right? I mean, I, I, I only recognize that this here is a coffee cup because I have a concept of a coffee cup, right? And I apply that concept to what I'm perceiving and I go, oh, look, there's a coffee cup, right? Now, when you're dreaming, you don't have input from the external world because you're asleep. So you have the concepts, but what you need is something to work with. So you need something from an internal source. Um, you, yes, it's true. Uh, it's not like you're you're completely uh, cut off from the world when you're asleep, uh, a loud noise can wake you up. Um, um, sometimes even people's alarm clocks get incorporated into the dreams, right? Um, the dream, um, you know, you'll hear, you'll hear your alarm clock and perhaps it will seem to you that an alarm is going off in your dream, potentially, right? Um, <clears throat> but anything loud enough or sudden enough should wake you up. Um, now, when we're when we're asleep and we don't have this rich sensory, uh, rich set of sensory information to draw on, you can uh, you can be sure that the brain's going to find something, and that's probably memories, emotions experiences from the day before to put together these new experiences during web sleep yeah. and and really after that it becomes very stream of consciousness he calls them schemas i call them concepts and most philosophers would call them concepts but what follows is a sort of stream of consciousness sort of activation of these conscious uh, of these concepts um and it's very stream of consciousness because, again, we don't have sensory information um, from the external world being used to put together our experience for us. Um, uh, you know, it's kind of like maybe I had a maybe I have a test coming up and I'm thinking about that before bed. So those memories, those experiences, those emotions and those concepts are all somewhat active as I'm going to sleep. 
as I enter REM sleep and my, became, my brain becomes more active again, those concepts might still remain somewhat active or become reactivated. And so that's what my brain uses to build an experience out of. And I might have an anxiety dream about failing the test or missing the, uh, missing the deadline or something, right? Um, why are dreams so wacky though? Uh, so weird and changeable and full of all kinds of strange stuff. Well, when I, we're awake, like right now, our experience of the world is stable because our representation of the world is stable and our mental representation of the world is stable because the world is stable, right? Um, I could leave this room, go somewhere else, come back and my laptop unless some other agent had moved it, would still be here. But if I leave, if I'm dreaming and I leave this room, um, I'm not even sure I'm going to be able to come back to the same room because there is no room, right? The matrix, there is no spoon, right? It's like that, for, but for dreams. Um, also, as I said earlier, your dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is much less active during REM sleep than it is when you're awake. And this is associated with critical thinking. Um, so maybe you miss these strange things because the center of your brain that you rely on for reasoning and planning and executive function just isn't uh, sufficiently activated. So you leave the room and then come back and it's a completely different room and you don't even notice. Um, so that's kind of how dreams might work. Um, all right, let's see. Why don't we go ahead and take a quick break? Say 10, 15 minutes. Is that good? All right. Yeah. I just have to re-up on the coffee, to be honest. Um, it's been such a busy semester. <laughs> I just, it's like, wow. One, one of these days I'll catch up on my sleep, though. Um, mark my words. Um, all right, let's uh, take a quick break, and we'll come back and uh, talk about whether dreams count as experiences. Um, then maybe we can chit-chat a little bit about astral projection, out-of-body experiences, and so forth. Okay, so um, I will be back at, uh, well, let's just say one. <laughs> that happens to me, Conrad. I'm like, oh, I'm so tired. You know, um, I'm like so stuck in my routine. Um to the extent that if I have to get up early, like yourself, and then I go and do a thing, and, and then it's like, oh, well, I'll be tired enough to go to bed. I won't. I go to bed at the same time, whether I've slept in or whether I've gotten up so early. It's always around the same time. Uh, and, and I don't think there's anything I can do about it. <laughs> like, I've tried. People talk about sleep hygiene and stuff, and I'm, I don't know. If for me, it's just... That's what it is. That's what's happening. That's the that's the routine I've fallen into, and that's how it is. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Um, one day I'll sleep in though. Anyway, okay, let's get out of here, and um, I'll see you at one, all of you.
All right, let's begin again. Oof. Okay. Oh. Ah. So our dreams experiences. I've been talking about them as if they might be. But this was actually not always the received view. Um, so a bit of background on this slide. Um, in the, I mean, the, the term lucid dream, let's just take lucid dreams, for example. The term lucid dream was coined by a Dutch psychologist named Frederick Van Eden, uh, I believe in the late 19th or early 20th century, if memory serves. Um, but we've known about such dreams since antiquity. Dreams in which um, one is aware that they are dreaming. So if you're aware that you're dreaming, uh, like forget about regular non-lucid dreams for a second. If you're aware that you're dreaming, that is in an important sense, a conscious experience because consciousness, uh, it, it, one, of the, one of the things that we mean when we use that word is awareness. But one of the other things that we use that word for is um, wakefulness. Um, I am conscious right now in the sense that I'm not asleep, but I'm also conscious in the sense that I'm aware of what I'm doing. I'm sitting on my couch in my living room. I have my dog here uh, curled up in a little bagel shape beside me. I am lecturing on dreams. I look out the window and I see this lovely uh, horse chestnut tree, which is still in bloom, which I'm just so psyched about because I get to watch all the bees and birds and stuff. Um, so I am conscious right now. And in a lucid dream, I'm conscious in a similar way. Um, and we've known that lucid dreaming is a thing since an antiquity. Um, and there's an argument to be made that even non-lucid dreams are experiences in the sense that they, they sort of happen to us, we can recall them, we can talk about them, and maybe we even have some limited agency within these dreams. But in the 20th century, the prevailing wisdom, and this was probably just, a, just, just what the spirit of the times in the, in the early to mid 20th century, it was thought um, within philosophical and scientific circles that dreams could not be experiences. Why? Well, when you're asleep, you are unconscious. How can one be conscious when one is unconscious? Therefore, dreams are not conscious experiences. That's the wisdom. That was the received view. Um, and um, working from that basis, Daniel Dennett, um, a philosopher of mind and cognitive scientist. Um, <laughs> well, I'll come, I'll come back to that in a sec, Janita. Um, but um, so Dennett has this theory where dreams are not experiences. They are um, what he calls spontaneous memory insertions. Now, as I said a moment ago, just to address Janita's point, um, sure, you've, you haven't experienced riding a horse. Uh, you don't have any actual hours on a horse, right? But, um, but your dream of riding a horse is an experience of exactly that, a dream of riding a horse, right? That's what I would say. Also, I mean, uh, to get back to what I was saying about um, mental imagery and dreaming and its role in practice you could you could probably you could maybe even construct an argument that if you if you had some time on a horse and then you wanted to practice you could do it in a dream or by or with your imagination um uh, i don't know too much whether this has been done uh with equestrian stuff but I know that a lot of sports psychologists have, have looked into this sort of thing, uh, mental rehearsal, whether that be just mental imagery, you know, your imagination or lucid dreaming. Um, so certainly um, 
there there could be an argument there that um that those kinds of things do count as experience and i i invite you to consider writing a paper on that if you're interested any any of you who are interested in that that would make a really interesting paper um if dreams are experiences or aren't experiences why or why not um sort of thing i think that would be cool uh but yeah dennett um dennett is still around he's um i think he's um emeritus uh, professor at Tufts University in uh, the United States. So experience means something we are conscious of now. Like I, something is happening to me, a conscious being. Um, and experiences can also be episodic. So like if I ride a roller coaster that I have an experience of riding the roller coaster, right? It's, it's an episode that happens to me, the conscious agent in the picture. Um, that's the sense in which we're talking about experience here. Um, so Dennett has this idea um, that says dreams are not experiences, following from, from the sort of rece received view about dreams in the uh, mid to late 20th century. Um, this has come to be known as the cassette theory. Um, and what Dennett says, essentially, is that dreams are not experiences. They don't happen to us. So, like, uh, we don't, it's not as if we go into REM sleep and a bunch of dream events happen to us over a stretch of time, and then we wake up from that and remember it. Um, rather, it's more like a story is composed unconsciously during REM sleep and record it on something like a cassette tape. And then um, at the moment we wake up, the tape is inserted and we can play the tape. And it seems like a memory of an experience, but it's not. Now, there must be two processes at work for this to occur. We need a composition process. That's what develops the dream narrative when we're asleep. So it's not actually an experience we're having. It's, um, it's like a fictional story that our brain writes. And then it pops it into memory when we awake. Um, and our playing that tape makes it seem like an experience that we've had, when in fact it's not. So Dennett doesn't think dreams count as experiences. And by the way, I don't know if Dennett's changed his views on this. I suspect he probably has, but um, <clears throat> but um, we're going to go with this just to consider whether dreams really count as experiences or not. Um, so what we think we remember as an experience is really um, popped in like a cassette into a tape player. Um, so for Dennett, you know, one of the one of the things about consciousness we say in, in consciousness studies is that for something to be conscious, it has to have a phenomenological sort of element to it. Uh, what that means is that uh, it's qualitative, it's first person, it, 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 it's there's something it's like to to undergo such an experience. Like think about your um, your last experience of eating an apple. There's something that it's like to eat an apple, the, the, the biting of the apple, the crunch you hear, the taste of the apple, um, so on and so forth, right? For Dennett, there's nothing it's like to dream because they aren't actually experiences. But there is something that it's like to have had a dream because according to Dennett's argument, they are spontaneous memory insertions. Blackmore says this is a difference that really doesn't make a difference, and I'm not sure I agree with that for reasons that I'll discuss shortly. But um, just because this is a bit of a weird idea to, to sort of wrap your head around, I just want to make sure everyone's kind of on the, on the same page as me before we go ahead. So, you know, it's not like um, I have a dream and my memory of, the, of that dream is recorded on some kind of camera, and that's what I play back. Rather, it's as if the the recording the, the events never happened. They're just composed onto this tape. But I can still play the tape as if it were a recording of something that had happened. Do you guys see what I mean?
Yeah. Okay. No. <laughs> yeah. Understandable. It is, it is a weird idea, right? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Conrad, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay. So Carol, like, um, let's say I have a dream that I'm eating an apple. Um, on the view that dreams are experiences, I'm, I'm having a dream where I take the apple and take a bite out of it. And mm, that's a yummy apple. And then I wake up and remember having done that. But on Dennett's theory, none of that actually happens. What actually happens is my brain puts together a story. So Josh picked up the apple, took a bite out of it, and, and he liked it. And then we pop that in at the moment of awakening. And I remember it as if it were an episode, but it never happened in the dream. It was composed. It didn't actually occur. Okay, awesome. Yeah. But yeah, this bit about the, the AI generated, yeah, I think so. AI generated images do remind me a bit about how dreams are composed and and yeah that could be because of the neural network stuff um i mean our brain is that that's what neural networks are they're meant to be um neurologically plausible computational models of the brain so they are inspired by the brain in a in a, in a pretty important way so um i think it would be really cool if we tried to get a neural network to dream um you know what I need to do that. Um, uh, I'm, I, I'm getting a new computer soon um, that should be able to handle neural networks a little bit better than the machine I've got now. I wonder if I could teach it to generate a dream from day residue, what Freud called day residue, your memories and emotions and stuff that are on your mind um, that appear in dreams after you've fallen asleep from the previous day. Wouldn't that be cool? Somebody's got to do this. I got to try to do this. Uh, if it hasn't been done already, it might have, somebody might have already done this, <laughs> um, but we'll see. Um, okay. Back to the next slide. Now we're going to come back to Dennett's idea because lucid dreaming uh, kind of throws a wrench into what he's saying there. So a lucid dream, again, is a dream where you know you are dreaming. Now, as I mentioned before, we've known about them since antiquity. But for the same reason that Dennett doubts that dreams are experiences, uh, scientists and philosophers also doubted whether lucid dreaming was possible. Uh, because again, when you are asleep, you are unconscious. And in a lucid dream, you're conscious to the extent that you're aware that you're in a dream. How can you be unconscious and conscious at the same time? Doesn't make sense. So the prevailing wisdom was that lucid dreaming was somehow not real, um, that people were merely dreaming that they were aware that they were dreaming and not actually aware, <laughs> you know? Um, that's the prevailing wisdom. But in the late 1970s and early 80s, lucid dreams were shown to be real, scientifically demonstrated. Um, and it was interesting because one of these uh, researchers, Keith Hearn, was actually a parapsychologist, right? I, um, uh, before, before this, uh, lucid dreaming was the realm of parapsychology. Um, but now it belongs to the realm of science uh -huh. oh uh -huh. too so um how did they do this well keith hearn and stephen laberge uh did it in um well keith hearn did it in uh i think at the university of hull in 1979 um laberge did the same thing at stanford in 1980 pretty much the same thing um, they hadn't been talking with one another, but they, they, they had just kind of happened to converge on the same idea about the same time. And this happens in science. In fact, it's called convergence. Um, 
Um, and the reason why people tend to study, stumble across the same discoveries around the same time is because they're working from the same knowledge base. Think of um, evolution, right? Um, uh, nowadays, we talk a lot about Darwin, but evolution was co-discovered by Alfred Russell Wallace around the same time. The only reason why we give Darwin the credit is because he had a mechanism, natural selection. Wallace didn't. Um, or calculus, uh, co-discovered around the same time by Isaac Newton and Gottfried Leibniz. Um, nowadays, Newton gets the credit, but Leibniz's system of notation is, is the system that we use when we, when we do calculus. Um, same with lucid dreaming. We're working with the same background, working on the same problems, and two people came up with a very similar idea around the same time. And that's often how science works. So in each um, group of studies, the researchers had participants who were skilled at lucid dreaming. Leberge calls them oneironauts, which is Greek for explorers of the dream world. Now, both Leberge and Hearn knew that when your eyes are moving about under your closed eyelids in REM sleep, that's because you're actually looking around in the dream scene. Why did they know this? Well, this was actually discovered by completely by chance. Um, there was a fellow who was in the sleep lab. And on the sleep lab, we can track eye movements. Um, we can actually do it with EEG if we want, because um, those electrodes that pick up the um, changes in electrical potential at the scalp can also pick up the electricity from your muscles moving. Um, and if you've ever had an EEG before, you'll know that um, you can see eye movements on the output of the machine. And those actually have to be filtered out using lots of statistics and math and stuff. But anyway, this fellow was in the sleep lab, was being monitored. And it was noticed that, you know, during his dream, his eyes are moving randomly, do, 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 do rapidly moving about. But then there was a period where his gaze went like, right, left, right, left, slowly back and forth like this. And so they woke him up and said, hey, that was weird. Your eyes were going all over the place. And, uh, and then they were very regular. What, what were you dreaming about? And he said, oh, I had a dream that I was watching a game of ping pong. And he was watching the ball going back and forth, tracking it as it was volleyed across the ping pong table. So we knew, we had confirmation that um, your eyes aren't just randomly moving around. You're actually looking around the dream scene. And your real eyes are physically moving. So, um, so what uh, Leberge and Hearn both independently decided to do was to get their participant to, to give a pre-arranged non-random signal with their eyes uh, once they became lucid in a dream and they could detect this with their equipment in the sleep lab. And this is so interesting. Think about it. You go into the sleep lab, uh, you're asleep, you're dreaming, you realize you're dreaming. So you signal, maybe it's right, left, right, you know, right, left, right, left, right, left, or something, you know, it's something that you and the experimenters have agreed upon. So we know that it can't be due to chance. Um, then maybe you do an experiment in the dream. One thing Leberge really um, was interested in, in in his early days was the subjective passage of time. So um, a person might, might send the signal that they realize they're dreaming. Then they'll send another signal to, to um, indicate that they've started counting. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. And then they'll send another signal when they finished counting. And we find that it takes about as much time in real life to count to 10 as it does in a dream. So time seems to subjectively pass at the same rate in dreams as it does in waking life. Um, yeah, that, it's so cool. And by the way, this is what moved the study of lucid dreaming out of parapsychology and into actual sleep science, um, which is an important lesson, right? Once we actually understand an anomalous phenomenon, it stops being paranormal. 
it ceases to be a, a parapsychological topic of investigation. Um, so this to me suggests that Dennett's cassette theory cannot be right. Because remember, the idea in Dennett's theory is that we are unconsciously composing a narrative. So we're not actually experiencing anything. And then that is just popped in upon the moment of awakening. But how could that be if this is happening? If I'm signaling in real time from a dream, oh, okay, it's time. Uh, I've realized I'm dreaming. So signal, okay, now it's time to begin the experiment. So another signal, do the experiment, signal, uh, and then wake myself up and give a report to the scientist in the lab. Sounds pretty darn experiential to me. Um, and it's hard to square how this could happen if Dennett's cassette theory is true. Another thing about Dennett's cassette theory is like, oh, it's, it's a memory insertion that's popped in at the moment of awakening. But we don't remember most of our dreams. And we don't necessarily wake up from all of our dreams. And we dream multiple times a night. Um, yeah, I just don't think it captures what's going on. And I think LaBerge's work is pretty good for showing why. So let's talk a little bit about out-of-body experiences and maybe try and connect them to astral projection. Out-of-body experiences are when you have the experience of being out of your physical body. Now, there are numerous kinds, but the kind that I'm concerned with here are probably related to lucid dreams. Some people claim that when they are falling asleep, they have this experience of leaving their body. Almost as if the soul or the mind came out and floated around a bit and then went back in. Um, these are probably, I think, related to dreams. Um, and I think they're particularly related to false awakenings and sleep paralysis. So firstly, what is a false awakening? A false awakening is when you have a dream that you've woken up and you think you're awake and then you discover that you haven't woken up. Um, false awakenings can co-occur with sleep paralysis. And sleep paralysis is a curious phenomenon where you're kind of awake and dreaming at the same time. So you're lying in bed, seemingly awake, but your body is paralyzed because you're in REM sleep and your brain is still dreaming. So you start hallucinating, seeing things, right? Uh, and it can be particularly frightening if you don't know um, what's going on. Uh, I, I'm not sure, Sydney. I'm sure there are, I'm sure there are some traditions where that is where that is the case, but I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, I guess it, some people hold that dreams come to you from the divine and others might hold that you go to where the dreams are instead, right? Um, but say you're experiencing sleep paralysis. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know, but... Um, yeah, if you, if you want to, uh, you know, share, share some more knowledge in, in the chat there, um, you know, I, I would certainly be learning something new. Um, uh, so, okay, so um, sleep paralysis, you're kind of awake and asleep at the same time. And re remember, this is what used to, um, this is probably what explains the accounts of the incubus and the succubus from the Middle Ages in Europe, the so-called old hag. It was a demon, it was believed, that would visit you and uh, try to steal your um, sexual energy or perhaps even assault you. Um, well, the medical cause is just your brain, you haven't completely woken up yet. You know, and it's a normal thing that happens to people. Um, it's, if you have sleep paralysis, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. Right, it's something that can spontaneously happen. Um, but it's like you're sitting there in bed awake, but you're paralyzed and also still dreaming, essentially hallucinating. 
uh, which can be frightening, which is why um, it might be, a, I mean, it could be Taylor, but, um, but I don't, um, but I don't know. It's actually not a chemical thing. It's, it's that um, the, the signals to the body are blocked at the cerebellum. So, um, so the cerebellum is, it, it's called the little brain. It's like on the bottom. If you've seen the brain, you know, there's a little weird striated looking thing at the bottom out of which the spinal cord comes. That's your cerebellum. And what, one of the things the cerebellum does is regulate outgoing motor information. Um, you know, damage to the cerebellum is something that happens in Parkinson's disease, for example, which is why people with Parkinson's can kind of have like rigid jerky movement. So when you're paralyzed in REM sleep, the signals don't travel out of the cerebellum to the rest of the body. Um, it's regulated by hormones, but um, it's not like there's a specific chemical that does a specific job here. Um, neurotransmitters are used and reused uh, all over the place, even in the rest of the body, right? Um, like you've got serotonin in the brain, you've got serotonin in your guts. But the serotonin in your guts does something completely different than the serotonin in your brain does. Um, but yeah, so basically you wake up, but you're still in a REM sleep paralysis. And um, perhaps you find that very frightening. So you dream that a demon is coming to get you. Um, <laughs> uh, well, maybe you, yeah. Yeah, if you're worried about, don't worry about sleep paralysis because it doesn't have to be frightening. And once you know what it is, you can actually use it to have a lucid dream. Um, another thing that sleep paralysis might explain is, as I've mentioned earlier, cases of alien abductions. Um, back in the day in medieval Europe, um, people believed in demons. Um, so what kind of experience will your dream, uh, your dreaming brain put together for you? Maybe if you're frightened, something, something, something involving something frightening, like a demon or a witch or something. But in the 20th and 21st century, not as many people believe in uh, demons. Uh, more people believe in aliens. So maybe you have a dream that you're being abducted by aliens and taken up into their spaceship and probed and whatnot. Or you may have an out-of-body experience. You may essentially slip back into a dream and as you're doing so, have this feeling that you're leaving your body. And the subsequent experience of floating around the room as a sort of disembodied ego um, is in fact a dream. Um, because think about what it would mean if you actually did leave your body. It would imply that um, something like substance dualism is true and that naturalism or, or at least physicalism is false. Um, which are assumptions that I just don't think we should dispense with because they work so well for explaining everything else, right? So it's not literally like the soul leaving the body. It's really more like a dream. Now, keep in mind, one thing I want to qualify this with is that um, this does not explain all out-of-body experiences. Not all out-of-body experiences happen when we're falling asleep or waking up. There are other kinds of uh, out-of-body. Uh, oh, that's cool. Unfolding yourself. Oh, I like that. I like that. That's pretty neat. Yeah, unfolding. Like, like how a flower blossoms? Is that the sense of unfolding? Like, like, like this? Ooh, up in, yeah, I like that. That gives me cool mental imagery. Um, very neat. Um, so what was I saying? Oh, right, right. Uh, I want to qualify this claim. This does not explain each and every out-of-body experiences. There are other out-of-body experiences um, we can point to. For example, if you are in uh, like a sort of peak performance or um, a flow state. Um, you might have the uh, experience of leaving your body. Um, I remember watching an old, I think it was a, re a, 
professional wrestling documentary. I used to watch that <laughs> back in the day. Well, everyone did during the Attitude Era, right? Um, everyone was watching wrestling on television. You know, it was a, it was the big, uh, all the big guys were there. And, uh, you know, it was like late nineties, early two thousands, WWE era. So I was watching this wrestling documentary about the, um, the, the hell in the cell match between, uh, Mick Foley and the undertaker, which was absolutely insane. Like I know wrestling is not I mean, it's, it's not real. It's, it's performance art. It's not a sport. It's more like a performance art. But we're talking like throwing people off of cages and stuff. So it's still pretty brutal. And The Undertaker's giving this interview where he's talking about this match where he, he had this out-of-body experience where everything was so huge and insane. Like it felt like he was watching himself in the match. So that's another kind of out-of-body experience that maybe happens when you're in something like a flow state. Um, there's also near-death experiences. So near-death experiences are like, um, well, what they sound like, you are, you are literally dying. Or perhaps you have clinically died and you'll have the experience of having left your body. And then when you're resuscitated, um, you uh you feel like you're back in your body i think this could be something to do with the dying brain not not exactly the same as sleep paralysis but not really too different than sleep paralysis either i think that's probably what's going on so just be aware there are other kinds of out-of-body experiences uh but when it comes to those ones that we have when we're falling asleep or waking up uh, I think that this explains those. <laughs> hey, maybe, maybe the soul does leave the body. I don't think that, but who knows? Maybe I'm wrong. Materialism might be false. We don't know. Uh, I don't think it is, but who knows? Um, if you want to have... Oh, geez, I hate that doorbell. Uh, I think I have a delivery... Um, uh, I'm going to have to go get it. I don't want any porch pirates coming. Let me just go grab. Sorry, everyone. I'll be right back. Stop parking. Hey, Tula, it's just the mailman. Man, it was great. When I first moved in, our dog had never actually reacted to doorbells before because we never had one. Unfortunately, now she's kind of been conditioned to bark at the doorbell, which is a pain in the butt. But what are you going to do? Okay. Yeah, right? No, that's what they're called. They're porch pirates. They get your, They come and take your stuff from your porch um oh that's a good idea but yeah maybe 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 my dog would react to that too but you're right that that um doorbell is the worst doorbell ever um it sounds and feels like i'm getting shocked every time i hear it i don't like it um so just real quick relating this to astral projection uh, that is the idea that not only do you leave your body, you leave this plane of existence. 
Um, so that is also related to the out of body experience. Um, and the idea is that you leave your body and go to um, some other plane of existence, perhaps a higher dimension. Uh, although I, I don't know what that is supposed to mean. Um, and, and essentially I take, um, oh, that's, that's really interesting um, because Susan Blackmore, the author of this chapter of, uh, well, the whole book, the chapter is from, became interested in parapsychology because she had an out of body experience when she was smoking weed with her friends uh, back, in, back in the day. So that's actually pretty interesting. Um, and yeah, it's good to point out that there are also out of body experiences that are produced by, um, that are elicited by uh, like substances. So um, they're, they're like an altered state of consciousness. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I get, I get it. But you know, the thing is, when these guys say higher dimension, they don't mean like, that they mean oh i'm going where the angels are or where the the aliens live or or something like that right um and i don't want to say too much about astral projection uh but it just seems to me that a much more parsimonious explanation of what's happening is that no unfortunately you are not being transported to another plane of existence or another dimension um you're having a dream or, or, or some kind of altered state of consciousness. Because remember, um, the brain is what builds this experience for us, right? Um, and your brain can do a lot of interesting things. Your brain can create some pretty wacky altered states of consciousness. Um, and I just think it's a, it's, a, it's a more parsimonious explanation to say that, uh, you know, in the cases of out-of-body experiences, at least the kind we're talking about here, you're probably dreaming. And in cases of astral projection, um, you are not actually leaving the body and traveling to another plane of existence. You are having a dream, a hallucination, some kind of altered state of consciousness. That doesn't mean they can't be fun. Just because they're not real doesn't mean it's not an interesting experience to have, doesn't mean that you can't learn something from it about yourself. It just means that you're not literally going to another dimension, right? Um, oh, wow. Yeah, I can imagine that would be trippy. I've had many a lucid dream, but I've never had an out-of-body experience. And I'm kind of like, oh, I, I, I'd like to. I think it would be interesting. But no chemical substance prescribed or unprescribed has ever caused a an out-of-body experience in me i guess i just don't have the brain for it um i don't know um although one thing i would like to try um is um <laughs> dmt right no um <laughs> no one thing i would like to try is sensory deprivation um Yes, I would like to try sensory deprivation because sensory deprivation can also be conducive to these kinds of experiences. Why? Well, your brain is awake, but there's no sensory information because you're being deprived of that, or at least there's very little sensory information. And your brain will start to hallucinate in, in place of that because your brain is like, I'm awake, but where's, where's everything? Ah, oh, I need something. Blah. And it kind of makes an experience for you, right? Um, DMT, I mean, look, I, I, in my consciousness class, I have a whole lecture on drugs and altered states. I'm, I'm totally okay with uh, bringing this up. Um, but a word of warning, okay? I, and I know I'm not a medical doctor, but I know that most, a lot of you are at that age. Um, you know what I'm saying? You're, um, you're in, uh, you're in university, uh, you're at that age where you try stuff. Um, you need to be careful with um, psychedelics. Uh, psychedelics are by and large not harmful unless you're on certain kinds of medication. 
right? Psychedelics are probably some of the least damaging substances out there. Um, unless you have a genetic predisposition to some kind of schizotypal, schizophrenia, you know, sort of thing, um, you're probably okay. But if you are on um, SSRIs or SNRIs, you want to be very careful um, because psychedelics work um, by virtue of um, the fact that the, their chemical structure is very similar to the chemical structure of serotonin. And they can um, act at, in place of serotonin or block its reuptake or sometimes both. Um, and that can cause something called, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, just listen to your, yeah, yeah, you can have the vicarious experience, right, if, if you don't want to take the plunge yourself, but um, these molecules are chemically similar enough to serotonin, um, yeah, set and setting, exactly, yeah, um, we'll get to that, but uh, so, so these things are chemically similar enough that the end result can be if you are already on uh, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, you can get something called serotonin storm. Um, and that can be bad. Mild cases, you just feel, whoops, uh, mild cases, you just feel kind of not very well. Severe cases, you can have a seizure. Um, so it's certainly not recommended to to do psychedelic substances if you are on those kinds of drugs. Uh, set and setting, if I may, what that means is that um, you want to make sure you're, you're, you have the right mindset and you're in the right place before um, experiencing psychedelics. You don't want to have a bad trip, man. You know what I'm saying? So you want to make sure you're in a nice comfy place and lots of cool stuff to look at i want to make sure your mind is right if you're if you're not having a good day probably shouldn't do it but if you're having an awesome day you probably could do it right um oh interesting yeah man yeah i don't know you'd have to ask your your doctor about that tabitha but um but that is curious maybe you already had high serotonin levels just just naturally and perhaps with an ssri it was just a little bit too much yeah yeah and you know carol that's fine you know drugs are not for everybody right um and there's some stuff you should absolutely never touch um right like um <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, yeah, even prescription drugs can be bad. I mean, uh, absolutely. Tylenol is horrible for your liver. Um, but here's the thing, right? Um, you know, there are some substances that you should ab absolutely never do. This is just stupid to do. And I say that um, with limited experience. I mean, I worked downtown um, for a lot of years um, in the midst of the opioid crisis. So, you know, I was working at a Tim Hortons and a lot of my regular customers were actually clients of the homeless shelter. And a lot of them were addicts. And when the opioid crisis hit, it was just bonkers. Um, and then for a little while before I started this course, I actually had to quit this job because this course got moved to the early summer but I was actually working at the supervised injection site for a bit. And, um, um, you know, the idea there is harm reduction. So come on, you have a safe place. Um, if, if, you, if there's an overdose, we can resuscitate you. Um, you know, it's just harm, harm reduction is the strategy. Um, but like after that, I mean, not that I had any inclination before, um, but even if you did after working at a place like that, I cannot, you know, I, I can, I can highly recommend not doing things like, uh, fentanyl, uh, and heroin and, um, you know, opioids, um, highly, highly recommend not doing that. Um, 
because uh, it just destroys people, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, drug, well, drugs, I mean, think about it. I mean, uh, you know, you, you certainly don't want to abuse fentanyl, but let's say you have cancer and it's causing you severe pain. Uh, fentanyl is what you will be prescribed. Um, and if it's used properly, it's okay. Um, but if it's abused, uh, it's certainly not going to be good. So, so you have to be careful, right? You have to be careful. But it's very interesting to me because um, the reason I'm going on this tangent is because, um, well, as you all know, um, cannabis was legalized in Canada. Um, and it's, um, it's legal in a lot of states, too, in the United States, from what I understand. And I think that psychedelics are probably next. I would not be surprised if we see a push for legalization of, of psychedelic drugs. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and Tabitha, exactly. You know, when I give the Altered States lecture in my consciousness class, I, I tell people, like, if by the way, if any of you are doing drugs and you would like to stop, talk to health and counseling services. Seriously. I mean, uh, because, yeah, I know that undergraduate a time is, is a time when people experiment. You're out in the world for the first time. You're trying everything new. I get it. Um, and sometimes you get stuck with something you don't want to be stuck with. And if you need help, let's pop, let's destigmatize addiction. You know, if, if you need help, there are places you can go for help. Um, so, you know, if you're doing drugs and you would like to stop, certainly speak with, um, that. Yeah, James, I, I know, uh, it's, it's, it's crazy, huh? Um, you can go, I think there are, I mean, I have two magic mushroom dispensaries within walking distance of my house now, um, <laughs> which is insane. And it's not like when, uh, the illegal cannabis dispensaries went up, like um, the liberals announced, oh, we're going to legalize it. And everybody kind of jumped the gun. And there were all these illegal dispensaries popping up before legalization went into effect. And the police would raid them and shut them down. That hasn't happened with these, um, which is kind of interesting. So I think that's the way the wind is blowing. Um, Yeah, not too often. And frankly, I think the police have better things to do. Um, and psilocybin um, can be used a, in, in therapeutic settings too, right? So, um, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, James, I think the, um, the cops were kind of like, why are we bothering with this? Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, um, but I think that's the way it's going, um, which is pretty cool, actually, um, pretty neat. So, um, that's just a little PSA, you know, if, if you're, you know, be careful, you're adults, be careful though. And if you need help, Let's destigmatize mental illness, addiction. These are things that really should be destigmatized. You know, if you need help, there there are resources uh, to, that you can go uh, go to. Um, uh, and if you're and if you're trying uh, out this sort of thing, this is not an endorsement, by the way. I'm not saying go out and I am absolutely not saying go out and try drugs. Definitely not. But if you do, because you're at that stage in your life. Just be careful, okay? Because another reason is that a lot of your brains, if you're under 25, your brain has not finished developing. So you might think, oh, I'm 19, I can do what I want. Um, uh, okay, yeah, but be aware that the, these substances can have effect, an effect on your brain, which is still developing up until you're about 25 years old. So just keep all of this in mind. Um, yeah, yes, yes, PTSD, depression, 
Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, as I think it was Maria who mentioned, you know, substances like these have also been used ceremonially um, by indigenous people for years and years and years. Uh, we're talking um, psilocybin mushrooms, we're talking peyote, um, you know, in Europe, uh, the fly agaric mushroom was probably used, um, uh, probably psilocybin too. I mean, psilocybin mushrooms grow everywhere. Um, they grow everywhere, all over the world. But don't go picking mushrooms trying to find them. Uh, that can be dangerous. You know, um, you might eat... Um, the wrong kind of mushroom and die before you even realize you've eaten something that's poisonous, right? So definitely only go out mushrooming in the wilderness with an expert, whether you're looking for stuff that's edible or otherwise, um, because you could eat something poisonous. So why do we dream anyway? They might be an epi epiphenomenon, they might be a spandrel. They might not serve a purpose. It's just something that came along as a free rider, right? On a system that can think and perceive and imagine. But, and I think this is worth taking seriously, dreams might be also for, uh, might also be important for formulating and testing new concepts, new action plans, basically as practice or play. Uh, an, an arena in which to learn. <clears throat> dreams might also just be the result of memory consolidation. The sometimes recollected experience that goes along with your brain moving information into long-term memory. That's another possibility. Or maybe it's some combination of all of this. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, Tabitha, exactly. There are some mushrooms that are edible. And then there are some mushrooms that look like the edible ones that are poisonous. And it's the reason is because the, edi the edible ones don't actually want to be eaten. So they mimic the poison ones, right? So one example is the morel mushroom. Morels are delicious. They're used in French cuisine and they, they're very yummy and they also have a distinctive look. Uh, actually, by the by the if you're outside of the nickel nickel building on a rainy day in the spring, and you go to that sign by the nickel building, you will find if you are lucky morel mushrooms growing in that patch. I know because I found some. Uh, they were a little past their expiration date, but they're there. Um, uh, turkey tail grow on trees, though, right? Um, or, uh, oh, oh, right, this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Conrad, yeah. Um, but, you know, there's a kind of mushroom called the false morel, which looks similar to a true morel, and those will make you very ill if you eat them. They probably won't kill you, um, but they are not, you're not going to have a good time if you eat one. And by the way, you can eat a false morel if you boil away the toxins. Um, but you better make sure you have a really well-ventilated kitchen. I wouldn't do this in a home kitchen. I would do it in a restaurant, but I wouldn't do it in a home kitchen because what's going to happen is those vapors are going to come up and you're going to breathe them in and you're going to get poisoned anyway. So just don't. Just don't go. Just go to the store to get your mushrooms. Your, for, for dinner, I mean, right? So we don't know. Dreams might serve no purpose. They may serve many purposes. We are not certain. But what if you want to have a lucid dream? Do you guys want to know? I mean, here's a, here's a pretty safe altered state of consciousness, right? Um, a pretty safe one. Um, okay, good. You need to do a couple of things. Uh, ooh. One thing, oh, one thing to do is to improve your recollection of your dreams, because after all, dreams are difficult to remember. Um, so you want to keep a record. You want to, every time you wake up, you want to get into the habit of lying still, trying to remember what you can. If you can only remember a few spotty details, that's fine. Get up, write it down. It, basically, you want like a dream diary or a dream journal. You don't have to write it down. You can record it, you know, whatever's easiest. 
what you want to do here is firstly, you're building your dream recall. You're getting better at remembering your dreams and you've got a record of your dreams so that you can go through that record and look at what is uniquely dreamlike about your dreams. So maybe, um, maybe you have one of those weird dreams uh, like a lot of people in North America, one of the most commonly reported anxiety dreams in North America is uh, your teeth falling out. Maybe you've had a dream like this where you're talking like, I'm dreaming, da 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 da, da and your teeth just fall out. Um, that's actually a pretty commonly reported dream in North America, um, not in the rest of the world. Why? I have no idea. Uh, another, another one is dirty bathrooms. Like some people have dreams about like really dirty public washrooms. Um, huh, that's interesting, Maria. Yeah, huh, interesting. Maybe you caught it from us. You caught the teeth falling out dream from us. Um, yeah, but the, but, and, the, and the dirty bathrooms too are another. There, I don't have the teeth falling out, but sometimes I have the dirty bathrooms. Um, so... Oh, interesting. Oh, geez. Oh, that's brutal. Yeah, that that sounds like. Ugh. So, you know, let's just say that you're one of those people that occasionally dreams about their teeth falling out. And now you know that because you've been taking a uh, record of your dreams and you've gone through them and you've gone, oh, OK, so uh, I've dreamed about teeth falling out eight times. Uh, in it, eight out of 10 times, I've had dreams of teeth falling out. So uh, what do you do with that? Well, um, uh, yeah, that's another one. Yeah, common anxiety things. But note, these don't have to all have to do with anxiety, right? You might just often dream of your dream car. Maybe you want to save up and buy a particular automobile when you're graduate, you're going to graduate, you're going to get that good job, and you're going to buy a I don't know, a BMW or something, right? So you are always dreaming about your dream car. Uh, and it's a regular thing. That's what you're looking for. Just regular dream occurrences. Uh, we call these dream signs in the informal uh, vernacular of the lucid dreaming community. Um, what you want to do is make a list of these. And then every time you see one in real life, or see something related to it in real life, or indeed anything dreamlike at all in real life, ask yourself whether you might be dreaming. This is called reality testing to make sure you're awake or dreaming. So for me, like, let's say my dream sign is teeth falling out. Well, the other day I went to the dentist, as you know, had the wisdom teeth removed. That would have been a pretty good opportunity to ask myself whether I was dreaming or not. Now, how do you tell if you're dreaming or not? Well, there's uh, a really simple way. Try and read something. Just look around the room and try and read any piece of text. Look away and look back. If you're dreaming, chances are the text will either have changed or it will have been unreadable in the first place. Um, and why is that the case? Yep, light switch too. These all work for the same reason. I'll talk about the light switch in a moment, but these all work for the same reason. If I'm reading something in real life, uh, like this book, How to Write One Song. Okay, am I dreaming? How to Write One Song. Okay, look away, bu -bu 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 -bum, look back. Okay, it still says the same thing. Why? Because there's a mind independent world out there. The world is real. It exists independently of whether I perceive it or not. So this doesn't change. This is stable because the world is stable. But in a dream, there is no spoon, right? This, I, my brain just puts whatever there. Maybe it's uh, how to write one song and then I look back and it's how to cook an egg or something, or, or it's just nonsense. The letters are just scrambled. Um, same with the light switch example. Um, the light switches work regularly uh, in real life because there's actual switches and electronics and stuff all wired up there. Uh, but in a dream, that's not the case. The clock, same thing, exactly. Digital or, or, or analog clocks. 
behave strangely in dreams. You can even try and push um, a finger through your hand. You can plug your nose. If you plug your nose and you can still breathe through your nose, you're dreaming because of course your actual physical nose is not actually plugged, right? So there's a lot of ways you can do this. And you just, you just basically get into the habit of doing this. And sooner or later, you'll do it when you're dreaming. And if everything goes well, you'll realize that you are dreaming rather than awake. You can also use specific techniques like mnemonic induction of lucid dreams and wake-induced lucid dreams. Uh, mnemonic induction of lucid dreaming, I'll leave a link to, to some information on the Discord server on how to do that. Um, waking induced lucid dreams are very simple. They're just when you try and go directly into the dream. So you can take advantage of the longer REM cycles you have toward the end of uh, your eight or nine hours of sleep. You know, maybe you, um, maybe it's a weekend and you have a chance to sleep in. So you get up, you've woken up, but you could still sleep more. So get into bed, lie still, and you might do something like count yourself to sleep simply by saying, one, I'm dreaming, two, I'm dreaming, three, I'm dreaming, so on and so forth. And you will very quickly enter a REM period, which will hopefully last a while. And if everything goes right, you'll be doing the exact same thing in your dream that you were just doing as you were falling asleep. You'll be like, 23, I'm dreaming, 24, I'm dreaming. Wait a minute, I'm dreaming. And bada bing, bada boom, you've got a lucid dream. A friend of mine tried this in elementary school, or elementary school, high school, when, when, when I was first learning about this. Um, and, and I told him, you should try counting yourself to sleep. So he did. The next day, I meet him on the school bus, said, what happened? And he says, well, I, I dreamed I was counting. And then I had a dream where I was at school counting on my desk, one, like writing it down on paper. And then I dreamed that the teacher told me to stop doing that because it, I had to pay attention in class. So I didn't, he didn't realize it was a dream, but it almost worked uh, is the point, right? Um, yeah, you know what? I haven't actually seen Inception, not going to lie. Um, I suppose I should. Um, so, oh, so that's all I have. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I just don't have time for big, long movies. Ah, I'll watch it. I'll watch it one of these days. Um, okay, what, what, what? That's it, that's the slides. I know, I know, I know, I know. Is it is it a good is it really good though like is it one of his straightforward movies like The Dark Knight or Dunkirk or is it like super convoluted for the sake of being super convoluted like Tenet right Yeah the music um Yeah I guess I'll have to give it a watch if it's part of the Zeitgeist right so um oh tenet wasn't as good okay well we'll check it out we'll check it out um maybe i'll review it um you know um that's a thing i've been thinking of doing on the youtube channel reviewing this stuff but as a cognitive scientist it might be fun yeah yeah fair enough um okay so uh let's see i think that's it yeah that's all um that's all i have we need to decide what we're going to do next time um uh my money is on anomalistic psychology that is what i would like to do because i'm prepared for it <laughs> um yeah, uh, for the proposal, um, I'm pretty sure in one of my previous versions of this class, um, I, I, um, I gave a lecture writing essay. So I will link you to that. Lecture writing essay? Hmm? You gave a lecture writing essay? 
I mean, uh, an essay writing lecture. Sorry, my partner, you're, you should be my director. You know that? Hey, that peanut butter smells good. I'm getting hungry. Um, yeah, and, and, and yeah, uh, okay, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, I will share um, info about the proposal in the form of a video on how to write an essay, uh, which I'm sure I've done before. So I'll just link, link that to you on Discord. Um, for Thursday, we will do anomalistic psychology. Uh, in the meantime, input your suggestions on the Discord server. So Taylor is really interested in exorcism. That would be awesome. Um, uh, cryptozoology would be good, but I need to know what cryptid we want to hear about. Um, so let me know. Do you want to talk about Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster? Well, what do you want to talk about, right? So let me know. Um, yeah, when do you goes count? Um, um no it's it's the it's the, the proposal is a, is an assignment um like a document um but it it uh it there's a template um there are actually a, a bit of instructions in in the template but i will don't worry I, i'll 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 find the video uh, the set of instructions that i'm talking about and i'll send it i'll put it on the discord server it, but yeah, in the meantime, don't worry about the proposal. I will push that due date back. The last reading response is going to get turned into a quiz. Um, and it's just going to make our lives all a bit easier. Um, okay, so for Thursday, we'll do anomalistic psychology then. And then I'll make an announcement. Uh, once I get some of your suggestions, I'll announce what we'll be doing next week. Uh, but, uh, but everybody, don't sweat the proposal for now. I'm going to push it back probably like a week maybe more. So don't worry about that. Okay. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, this was fun. Um, any questions about anything? Let me know either by email or on the Discord server. Um, so thanks, everyone. This was a fun one. I'll see you all next time. Oh, don't worry, uh, Ben, it's not going to be insane. Um, and by the way, it's probably going to be open book. Um, and you can always share notes if you need to, uh, before the test, of course, uh, but share notes. Um, uh, somebody who wants to share their notes with Ben, do it. Ben, also use the slides. The slides are basically my lecture notes. So, you know, it's all going to be good. You guys are going to do great. <clears throat> okay. I will see you all on Thursday. Uh, bye for now.